Hello, my name is Marie McCarthy. I'm the Artistic Director of Omnibus Theatre and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event this evening. Um, and I just want to say from us all, thank you so much for your support. Before we start, I'd like to show you something. and read all these poems in the books. This is, this is where I began to be a person in a library. So that's why I so desperately want them to keep this building and, and make it where we can have evenings like this and there can be exhibitions and music and we can be a, a community which doesn't have riots. We have good times. <laughs> And the hip hop hap of the clap of the hands to the twirl and the swirl of the girl gone chancing, glancing, dancing, backing and advancing, snapping of a clapper to the spin out and in, and the ting tong tang of the guitar. This is my local library, and so of course I'm desperately anxious that it stays as a place where the imagination is fostered. I know the council are going to put the book somewhere else, but this space is a great space. She was very sympathetic. I have to admit she was nice, but short of hoping we keep the windows wide open and the fire on full blast and breathe shallow and fast. <laughs> she was very short of advice. There is a local group who are fighting to preserve this place and they're called Omnibus because of the Clapham Omnibus, the famous man on the Clapham Omnibus. And that's all of us who live here. We're part of it. So it's not something that's been imposed from above. This is the grassroots people who live here crying out for a venue, an arts venue for ourselves. We've got one. And we want the council to let us stay here and have fun and make it work and nourish our imaginations. Six o'clock. The burnt out ends of smoky days. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots. And at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. And it must remain in the community for us to use and enjoy we can have music here and exhibitions, lectures, discussions. This is exactly what is needed. We haven't got anywhere like that. So for goodness sake, please, let's have it. A little word. Hey, Mrs. Corbyn, the one little, little word. My blessed corner. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> now we have Peter Guttridge in conversation with the one and only Miriam Margulies. Miriam, hello. Hello. God, it's How are you? scary with all this stuff, isn't it? This technical stuff. <laughs> you are very accomplished. I know you are at this. I have to say, because it is so odd doing it, I think you're in your home, in one of your rooms in your home. I'm really struck by that painting behind your head. Uh, oh, yes, that's, um, that's Daddy. Um, my father, yeah. my late father, Dr. Joseph Margulies, born in the Gorbals in 1899. And um, he was a, a lovely man, a lovely man, but he hated that painting. My, um, my friend Anne Christie uh, painted that and... Uh, later, later in life, excuse my interruption, later in his life? Yes, yeah, so he was in his 90s when that was painted and he said to me, um, I look very small in that, I don't like that <laughs> picture, it's too small. And I said, well daddy, you are small. And he was, you know, we are a short family. There was only three of us. And I am shorter than I was because 
I'm now, um, I think I'm four foot ten. <laughs> something ab absurd. Um, I'm letting everybody into the waiting room. That I can see sometimes it comes on my screen that somebody's in the waiting room. So I just say admit, uh, which is probably a bit naughty of me because I'm, I'm just not supposed to do that. But you know, what made me laugh, Peter, was when I looked at that a video which was just played, I'm, I'm not wearing exactly the same dress, but I've only got a few dresses and they all look the same. So the one I'm, <laughs> I'm wearing now is, a, is very similar to the dress that I wore, you know, for, for that show. Well, you look lovely in... now and you look lovely then. Well, I don't know about that, darling. Can, can, I go, well, well, can I go back to your dad a, just a bit before we get on to your magnificent Yes, career? of course. Um, you, well, your dad and your mum, really. Because you actually, although he was from the Gorbals and was a doctor, I think, which is, you know, quite an achievement from the Gorbals because it was pretty rough in his day, I would imagine. Uh, you, you were brought up in Oxford, weren't you? Yes, um, my father was the first member of his family to go to university about that. I've, I know that somebody in my family, Sheila, um, who will probably know this story because uh, she's one of my cousins, but um, I come from a Jewish family mm -hmm. and um, they were very poor. In fact, my great grandfather on my mother's side was a criminal and he went to uh, Parkhurst, Isle of Wight, for, for seven years hard labour for, for receiving stolen goods. Um, <laughs> it's hardly the way to, s to start this, but anyway, I, I think it's a great story. And um, my father's father was um, a peddler in, in little, um, little gems, you know, little sort of what we call chachkis, little little brooches and necklaces, which he used to put in a pack on his back and went round the miners' wives in um, in lowland Scotland. And they liked him because he was he was apparently I never met him because he died before I was born, but he was a he was a friendly guy and they liked him. And he made a lot of money in the end. And he bought um he bought a, a wholesale jeweler's shop in St. Enoch Square, which is one of the main uh, stations in, um, in, in Glasgow. And um, on the morning that my father had heard that he, he got into university to, uh, to attend a medical school at, the, at Glasgow University, he received his call-up papers to go to France. It was 1917. And he was 18, because he was born in 1899. And my, my grandfather, my, my grandfather, his father, um, saw that he'd been called up. And this was the First World War, which was um, a very dangerous time. Horrendous, yeah. For, for young soldiers being sent out. So he made a phone call and made an appointment to see the commandant of the 4th Battalion, the Highland Light Infantry, which was the one that my father had been assigned to. And he went to see him in the afternoon. This little, little old Jew in his best suit. And there he knocked at the door in the, in the uh, barracks. And there was this very substantial Scottish officer. I don't know whether he was wearing a kilt or not, but you know, he was in his full uniform. And my father, my grandfather knocked at the door and he said, come in. And this little man came in. And um, so he, he sat down and he said, well, what can, I, what can I do for you? And my grandfather said, thank you very much for, for seeing me this, this afternoon. I'm very grateful because I want to talk to you about something very close to my heart. And I want to explain to you that today my son, my firstborn, Joseph, he received the call-up papers for your regiment to go to France. And you know and I know that it's very dangerous. You know and I know that the young officer will maybe last six months 
in, in France. But for sure, he will not come back. And this is my firstborn. And he is going to be a doctor. Because they were very proud of that. So I'm going to ask you for something. But if I ask for something, also I must give something. So the, the soldier, who was probably, you know, a major or a captain, he said, right, well, what is it, you're, what is it you wish to ask me? And he said, I want to ask you for the life of my son. I want to ask you, please, to take my son's name away from the draft. I want you to let him continue his studies at Glasgow University. Please. But I don't ask without also giving. So he put his hand in his pocket and he took out a beautiful diamond which he held in the palm of his hand. He said, this is not flawless, but so nearly flawless. <laughs> it is the most beautiful diamond that I have in my warehouse. And I want that you should have it in exchange for the life of my son. And you know, when I tell this story, I usually say to people, and what do you think happened? Well, go on. So, <laughs> so I will tell you, it makes me, actually, it makes me cry this. Oh. Because I remember my father telling me this story. And he said, well, I tell you what happened. I told this story in, in a show that I, I did in Australia called The Importance of Being Miriam, which is very embarrassing to confess that it was called that because I, I don't think that I am important, but the producer wanted to do it. And so he called, he, he, um, I told, I told the story. And at the end, I said, well, I am here. So my, my father um, did not go to France. And think about what happened. And two ladies, two Scottish ladies who were in the audience in Melbourne, when I, when I did that, on the way out, they were heard to say, that's ridiculous. No Scottish officer would ever take a bribe like that. I simply <laughs> don't believe it. That's completely untrue. <laughs> well, sorry, girls. <laughs> he took it. But then and I'm here to prove it. Well, of course. But then bizarrely, well, not bizarrely, horribly, I mean, you were born, I don't want to be on Galam, but you were born in the Second World War. Do you have any memories of that? Any <laughs> I was born in, in 41, in 41, yeah. but I was conceived apparently in an air raid um, because, and that's why my hair is like this. That's what my needs to say anyway. <laughs> because uh, they were hiding in the cellars. My father went down to London eventually, having uh, become a doctor, and he was a locum in um, a practice somewhere in in um, West Ham, actually, which is why I support West Ham and Arsenal, by the way. Um, mm. And um, so he met my mother there in, in London at a Jewish tennis club. You didn't know there was Jewish tennis. I did not. <laughs> well, there is. And, uh, and they got married and... Um, I was not born for 11 years after the marriage because mummy was afraid of childbirth because some other cousins had died in South Africa in childbirth, which was true, as I discovered afterwards. And um, so they were hiding in the cellar of, of the house they lived in, in, in East 
in East Ham or West Ham, I'm not sure which. And, and uh, that's when I was conceived. And then they came to Oxford because Hitler had decided that Oxford was to be his capital when he, when he defeated the English. Oh, really? He wanted to have a, a beautiful place. Mm. So he, he chose Oxford. And that, that they'd heard that. And the car, their Morris Oxford car, was being repaired there. So they went there. <laughs> and um, that's where I was born. So, so which one of them, I mean, you are known, and I, I think you quite like being known for being either outrageous or naughty, depending on which newspaper is talking about you. Did you get that from your mum or your dad? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean... Oh, you? No, I mean, my, my parents were incredibly well-behaved, both of them. I, they, they would be appalled at the kind of language that I am <laughs> reported to be occasionally using. Um, no, I think that's just a, an, an unfortunate personality trait of mine um, because they were very conventional. They voted Tory. Um, they were, you know, just pillars of the community and, and, um, and very nice people. You know, they were, they were good people. Yeah. Um, but uh, they somehow gave birth to me <laughs> and I think it, they never got over the shock, really. <laughs> I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. But I mean, obviously, you were, you were a bright kid. You were, you were brought up in Oxford. You went off to Cambridge. You went off to Newnham College, which, uh, you know, is no mean feat uh, to study English, I think. And, and then got into kind of drama there. Well, um, I wasn't bright until the sixth form. I was naughty and... And I loved my school. My school was, was the Oxford High School, which is still a very good school. Um, it was called what they, um, a grammar school then. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an all-girls school. And, and I loved it. I mean, it was, it was a very happy time. And uh, Dame Maggie Smith was at the same school, but she's a bit older than me. And so I never knew her um, at school. I got to know her later. But um, it, it was a very, a very happy time. And um, Vanessa in, aren't you? I can see. I've yeah. just let her in. Come yeah. in, Vanessa. <laughs> um, and um, I didn't go to study English originally. I, I wanted to study Anglo-Saxon because ah. I thought that was a bit posh and different. <laughs> and then I found out that it was so bloody posh that nobody actually spoke it. So it seemed... <laughs> A bit of a waste of time, actually. Um, so I changed. I asked if I if I was able to change, and I, I got into Cambridge because my mother, who was a very shrewd woman, she'd left school at fourteen. Uh, she worked in her sister's dress shop in Peckham, in the High Road, Peckham, and which is you know a kind of lower lower class area. I mean. I didn't know what it is then, now. now. Now it's a bit posh now, because oh, everywhere really? is. <laughs> but um, why has Jenny got, gone away? She's got up and gone away. I can see that. But maybe she's gone to the loo. Oh, she's come back. <laughs> That's all right. You came You're allowed to go to the loo. <laughs> the audience can't see her, so that made no sense to them. Oh, really. I see. Oh, well, I can see some people, but not everybody. Anyway, um... My father was a, a doctor in Oxford, put up his plate and just started from scratch. And one of his patients was Sir Isaiah Berlin. Oh, really? Wow. Who, who, yeah, who was at that time one of the great public intellectuals of England. Yeah. yeah. And um, he was my, one of my father's patients because daddy spoke Yiddish and... Um, Isaiah Berlin's parents spoke Yiddish and they had come over with him from Latvia. And um, dad, mummy said to daddy, uh, why don't you invite Isaiah Berlin to supper? And he, he can sponsor Miriam going to university. And he said, don't be ridiculous. You know, he's a patient. I'm not, I'm not going to ask him to supper. That's out, outrageous. She said, Joe, ask him to supper. And she was very forceful, was mummy. And so in the end, he did come to supper. And he was a lovely man. I mean, just adorable. 
Uh, but he, and however clever he was, and he was super clever, he was completely unintelligible. You couldn't understand a word he said. Uh, um, it wasn't just his, his accent, but he was, uh, his diction was terrible as well. And, um, but he was lovely. I mean, you, you liked him, you know, and mummy cooked a lovely meal. And she said, Sir Isaac, could, would you, would you be kind enough to be Miriam's sponsor on the form for university? Uh, because she needs somebody to sign and it would be such an honor if you would. And he did, you see, because that was a, a speech of acceptance of the idea. <laughs> and so he, um, he signed my form for, for Cambridge and for Oxford and um, no university in the world would have refused somebody who was sponsored by Isaiah Berlin. You know, I mean, that was just mummy's shrewdness. She realized that I think that was the case. Was, if I may interrupt, I think you've been too self-deprecating. But anyway, I'm sure you... No, no, but it was true. How she knew, she left school at 14, she worked in a dress shop. How did she know that Isaiah Berlin was the one name that would have opened any door in the world, uh, any intellectual door? She knew. I don't know how. And well, that's, you... that made all the difference. And I got in to, to Newnham College with an exhibition. And it was a very well, happy you, time. Yeah. Well, you've, I mean, you've justified yourself so many times since. But I gather, but I can't quite figure out how, that you were pals with some of the Monty Python gang at Cambridge. Kind of one half. I think the other half were at Oxford or somewhere. But you were pals with some of the Monty Python Well, yeah? it, it's a very difficult area for me that because oh, um, okay. I I didn't like them oh, okay. and they didn't like me <laughs> they thought I was a pushy little Jew and and I was and I thought that they were you know conceited minor public school boys which they were I, I mean John Cleese certainly was a genius I don't think he is now I have to say. I, I think he's a, a crabby old bastard, actually. And um, they didn't like me, and I, it, it, it was not a happy union. But I was, I was clever, and I was funny. And they asked me to audition for the Footlights Review. And at that time, which was 1962, the girls were not allowed to join the Footlights. And of course, they, there were only girls' colleges. You know, there were male colleges and female colleges. And there were three uh, female colleges. And I was at Newnham. Now they're all, they're all mixed. Although I think Newnham is still... I'm not sure if Newnham is mixed or not. I think it's any, changed by now, I think. But I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't approve of it at all. I think it's much better to keep people apart. And then when they <laughs> finally meet, they kind of lust for each other and that's all very good but, well not um, in your case no no offense but not in your case <laughs> no but but i mean i think that it's better to keep things like that um not exactly on hold but <laughs> just, you know, not not too easy but um the, that's that's what happened i was in the footlights review and it was i was very because I was the only girl and there were eight eight men, um, I got a lot of attention and they didn't like that. That was not, <laughs> that was not popular. Well, so at what, age, what stage, what age did you decide actually you did want to be a performer? Um, was it before you went to Cambridge or, or was it when you went there and, and joined Footlights? I never, I never thought I would be a performer, actually. Um, I thought I'd be a doctor because I wanted to be like my father, whom, whom I admired. Um, but I was, you know, seduced at Cambridge, probably, by, by audiences. And I've always been seduced by audiences. It's very strange now to be talking into a little camera on the top of my laptop <laughs> and, and not see the audience and not, not know if I'm going over well or not. But... Just have sure to assume. I'm sure you are. Well, we don't know, but um, I, 
I discovered when I was at Cambridge that I loved performing and that I was given the opportunity to perform a lot. I did a lot of plays at, at university. I mean, it seems such a long time ago. And it was, I mean, 1962, that's 40. No, how long ago is that? It's, it's a long time. Don't ask me that. Um, you know. It must be 50, 50 or 60 years ago. I mean, I forget how old I am. You, you just sort do. of forget. We all forget. forget how old you are. But in fact, just I mean, before I move on to more recent things, um, I, saw, I saw that you were actually in Dixon the Dot Green, which hardly anybody in the audience will know what that was. But one <laughs> of the things I was Dixon of Dot Green, for goodness sake. Yes. Golly, I had forgotten that. Well, it, it was a, a, tel a very popular television program. And uh, Jack Warner was um, PC Dixon. Yeah. And, um, oh, somebody's sent me a message. That's nice. Thank you, Christine. Um, I, I remember um, meeting him and his sisters, he had two sisters who were on the halls called Elsie and Doris Waters. Yes, that's right. Because his real, I think his real name was Waters, but he changed it to Warner. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was very fond of, of, the, of them as performers. And Mummy um, and Daddy had a little house by the sea, uh, near Broadstairs, in a place called Kingsgate. And there's um, a lovely street going down to the sea called Percy Avenue. And we had a house in Percy Avenue. And they lived in Kingsgate as well. So I used to sort of tiptoe past Jack Warner's house in, in <laughs> Kingsgate and think that's where Jack Warner lives. Yeah. But that was, you know, many years later, I suppose, because it was, um, it was requisitioned by the army during the war and then my mother sold it. But I've always had um, a love of East Kent. And much later on, I bought um, my gun emplacement, which is... I know. The nearest house to France on the coast. And that's why you're known as Miriam Escobar. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, somebody's telling me that it's still all female at, um, at uh, Newnham. So I'm, hooray. Oh, okay. Come, come well, forever. That's yeah, good. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, yes, yeah, so, so you, you rented out your, your place in, uh, in, in Dover, the, further, the nearest place to France, to... A drug baron, essentially. Well, I didn't know they were, of course. I know. Well, um, because, say that, but because um, yes, the <laughs> the Daily Mail um, really uh, don't they don't like me because I'm on the left politically, which is fair enough, and um, they they called it the White Sniffs of Dover when they, when they were <laughs> reporting it. Well, that's quite good, actually. <laughs> I really did not know that they were that they were drug dealers and I was very astonished to learn it uh, but I did I did tell that story on the Graham Norton show I know and I got lots of bookings as a result <laughs> uh, I sold all the all the um, weeks of the year and then blow me this bloody COVID blow you is the right term when it's talking about cocaine actually uh. yes well I've never I've uh, I've never had cocaine uh, at all. I've never been a drug person. Well, you have £13 million pounds worth of it on the roof of your, of your house. That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> but I wouldn't know it if it got up and bit me, because I don't know what it looks like. I mean, for me, the, the great drug is chopped liver. That's the thing <laughs> that I love. And it's one of the problems of living in South London, and I do love South London, um, is that you can't get chopped liver here. Uh, so I, I have to rely on neighbours schlepping over to Golders Green and um, bringing me back some chopped liver because I, I do love it. Well, I'm sure they're willing to do that. I've, I've scarcely touched any of your life. We've got about four minutes before I'm going to go to questions from the audience. But um, So I want to talk about how busy you are now. I looked on IMDB, the, the kind of film site, and you've got about three films in post-production. You've got the, a thing called... A, Soul Man? I can't read my own writing here. The Soul Man, you've got a short called Wings, you've got a short called Ethel, you've got a, a bit of the Windsors, and of course you're doing this Miss Fisher thing. 
uh, in Australia? Because you work in Australia a lot because you've got a, a place over there and you're very fond of Australia. Well, my partner is Australian and yes. that's why I became Australian. And I would just like to draw to everyone's attention the fact that my latest documentary, which is a three-part documentary called Miriam Margulies Almost Australian, yes. is going out on BBC Two on Friday the 24th of, of July at nine o'clock. And it's a very good series. There are three programs and I'm very proud of it. So I hope you'll all tune in. Well, I've read about you, what you've said about that and, and, and you've explored areas of Australia you didn't know and you've, you've talked to lots of First Nation people and, uh, and, and you found it an eye opener, I think. Um, yes, well, we all, I mean, we all of us live in our little bubbles um, and we don't meet people outside the bubble. And I don't, I didn't know any First Nation people. That's, they like to be called First Nation rather than Aboriginal. But, you know, I, I'm used to calling people Aboriginal. Anyway, I, I didn't know any. And I insisted that I, I met some Aboriginal people and families. And I, I did in this, in this, um, uh, program and it was a it was an amazing experience well we all look forward to that so that's the 24th of july did you say yes friday night uh if you're if you're not if you're jewish you probably won't watch it but if you're not jewish there's no excuse not to watch it <laughs> <laughs> now just two, two quick questions is it true that you're on university challenge at newnham college uh, and you swore as per you well it, it is true that i did say fuck but not in sound because when it was put out and they saw me I went <laughs> and it was clear what I'd said but but it was actually not um it was beeped out but not with a beep it just wasn't it wasn't broadcast I'm not proud of it it's just rather an interesting thing because that was in 1962 that was when I was... That was early. That was um, early for those, for those words to appear, yes. yes. Yeah. One of the problems about doing these kind of chats is that I'm talking about myself all the time. And normally, you know, that is considered very impolite. Um, and, and I feel that I should be asking you questions. Because well, you know, I just remembered when I saw you and Greta Skarki together that you are lovers and I'd forgotten that. Um, um, so that's very interesting. Um, well, I'm sharing that with the... With exactly, the with the world, which was meant to be discreet, but okay. Moving Are on. you married or just living together? We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk, oh, okay. We're okay. Going to talk about the play you're going to be doing shortly with Amit Shah, which is uh, a follow-up to... The, well, not a follow-up, because it's no, no, in no way linked, but you're doing something with the company that did Birdsong so successfully. Uh, just recently. Yes, it's, it's a Zoom film. And um, I, d I don't know how it's going to work, but anyway, I've, I've, I've got the script. I'm just learning the script now. We're going and to film it next, next weekend. And you like the idea of doing this, a Zoom film? Um, I'm a bit nervous. I'm nervous. I'm, all, I'm, I'm always very, very nervous about doing anything, really. Um, I don't know how I agreed to do this. It's just that I love the omnibus so much that I felt I, I had to try and, you know, raise some, raise some money. So I'm very grateful to the people who are, who are there now. You've done this magnificently and I've scarcely scratched the surface of your career at all. You scratched my surface and it was like... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go now to questions from the audience, if that's good. Oh, right. Okay. There are 12 of them and we've got about 20 minutes. So I don't know what your maths are like, but we need to kind of not do too many... Uh, to spend too long on each one. So the first one is, what was it like to play a nun on Call the Midwife? It was wonderful to be on Call the Midwife. I, I play uh, now the character called Mother Mildred, who is the Mother Superior. Uh, it isn't easy because the habit you have to wear is very uh, complicated and heavy. And, you, and a wimple covers your ears. So it's quite hard to hear sometimes. So everybody has to just speak up. And when we were doing last year, the uh, Christmas episode, which was filmed in the Outer Hebrides, the weather was shocking. And we were totally soaked. And to be in a dripping wimple 
is no joke, I can tell you. But the the people in it are wonderful. It's a very happy company, and I'm uh, looking forward to, to rejoining it when, when we're able to. And um, that was, sorry, that was, that was a question from Claire Axton. Sorry, Claire, I didn't uh, say that at the time. Uh, Julia Mortimer has got a question. They've recently been watching the, the, the Miss Fisher things. Oh, uh, yeah. And Prudence, how is that working out for you? Well, that's over now. Um, that was filmed in Australia. I think I did three series of that and the film, which has just come out. And it was wonderful. I mean, I had the best time. And Essie Davis, who, who plays Miss Fisher, is, is a brilliant actress and a very, very nice woman. And we went to lovely locations and I wore amazing clothes. Um, and it was a very, I mean, nearly everything I do, I feel grateful for. And I, and I did love that. It was great fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And Andrew McIntyre uh, says, apart from the great get it uh, thing in Blackadder, um, how did you remain stony faced whilst making Blackadder? Well, it, oh, darling, it was a long time ago. I, I, it was, I was still very, very nervous um, of, of doing stuff. And um, Oh, somebody's asked me what brought you to Clapham. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and uh, rude. We've got the questions here. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm joking, I'm joking. You can do whatever you want. But um, it, it was, what was I talking about? I've completely You said about being, being stony-faced in Blackadder. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I was just too scared to be. I mean, I'm a professional. You know, when you're doing your job, you're not, you're not laughing. We thought it was funny, and it is funny, and I love seeing it again, but I don't watch myself. I, I never watch myself. That's so have you, never, have you never corpsed, as, as they say in your business? Have you never corpsed? Oh, yes, I have corpsed, but not watching myself. I mean, it's, you corpse because of what other people do, not, not because of what you do. Right. Um, oh, no, I, I find, I mean, it's, but you, you shouldn't. It's not professional to corpse. It's not fair on the other. It's not fair on the audience who paid for tickets. Yes. So. Um, Patricia Goldberg's got a more serious question about you visiting America and talking to lots of Middle American people, and uh, she wonders what you think of the current situation. And uh, in America. Yes. What do I think? Well, what does everybody think about it? It's a fucking nightmare. I mean, that bloody Trump. He should be sent somewhere. Um, probably to Guantanamo Bay and not released. He is a dangerous, stupid man. A very clever television performer, no doubt. But, it, but it's, a, it's a grotesque insult to the American people that he should be the president. And they think it's a democratic country out there. Well, it isn't. It's nonsense. I, I feel very strongly about that. I'm not I feel very sorry for Americans, actually, that they have to put up with that. I'm not going to ask you what you think about Boris Johnson because we know that and... and uh, <laughs> well, I have to be that. very careful. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I, uh, I don't want him dead. No, you I said... I not want him dead. I do not want him as Prime Minister. That's I know, you said that at the time and for some reason people didn't get the second bit of your thing, you know. Uh, but anyway, we won't go there. Um, now, Angela Maxwell, I'm going to come back to your story, to your question because I can't quite read it. But, uh, Sudi Pigger asks... What is your ultimate comfort food? Um, well, I have to say chopped liver, I suppose. Well, yes, clearly. From because I do love, and, and also coffee ice cream. My neighbour has just gone to Nardulli's, which is, if, if you live in Clapham, you'll know it. It's, it's a wonderful Italian restaurant, very near the, the omnibus uh, centre. And I've got co a great thing of coffee ice cream. Um, which is probably melting because it's on my study well, top. Feel free, to, feel free to scoff it whilst you're talking. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so ice cream and chopped liver. Okay, not together, obviously. But that no. Was... <laughs> if you want to answer that other question that got sent in to you. Yes, what... Uh, what brought me to Clapham? Well, my friend Peter Lavery, uh, I lived in Gloucester Terrace in, in um, well, my mother used to call it Bayswater, but it's actually Paddington and uh, W2. 
And um, when I was living there, he said, he lived in Clapham, and he said there's a house around the corner in a street called The Chase, and I think you ought to have a look at it. It's a lovely, it's a lovely house. So I went over to Clapham, which at that time was, you know, people just didn't live in Clapham. It was, it was an embarrassment. And um, I saw the house and I loved it. I, I thought it was a beautiful house. And I had a, a friend come round who was in property and I asked him to look at it and tell me what he thought. And he said, it's a good solid house. So I went to the estate agent who was in Streatham and I said, um, I'm going to get a, a surveyor. I'll get a surveyor's report. And then I think I'll get to put in an offer. And he said, he said, look, I, I know you won't believe this, but somebody who's been to see the house is bringing his surveyor this afternoon and he is going to put in an offer if it's a, if it's a you know, if, it, if, if the surveyor's report is good. And there was a pause and I thought to myself, I'm not going to let this person get that house. I want it. So I said, right, in that case, I will buy it now. And he said, well, what do you mean you'll buy it now? You haven't, you haven't had a surveyor's report. I said, I, I know enough about property because my mother was very good at that sort of thing. Uh, she had lots of houses um, when she came to Oxford. That's what she, how she made, you know, daddy didn't make any money. It was mummy that made the money. And uh, I said, I'm going to buy it. I'll give you a, a check for 10%. And I bought this beautiful house, which is, which is five stories uh, in the best road in Clapham, the Chase. Never mind Crescent Grove, that's for prostitutes. This is a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful street. Oops. And, and um, it was 21 and a half thousand. 21 wow. and a half thousand. And it's now, uh, well, you, we shouldn't be talking about money, but you know, it's always very interesting. And it's worth about 2.1 million. Anyway, I mean, it's shocking that that is so. And people say, you know, call yourself a socialist and talk about money like that. Well, I'm telling the truth. Anyway, I bought it. And that's yeah. how I came to Clapham. And in fact, you've... you've, you've in bought... 1973. Well, so that wasn't much... That was... Well, actually, that was still expensive then. That was very expensive then. Yeah. 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 But in fact, you've bought around the world. You've got this place in, this, in Australia, which I've been on the website of, which looks absolutely gorgeous. Oh, it's wonderful. Islands. Yeah. Did it survive the bushfires? Okay. I know it you did. Were... It was under threat. Yeah. Uh, it's in the Southern Highlands south of Wollongong in yeah. New South Wales. Yeah. We had fires within 30k on uh, both sides of it, but we, we were lucky, we survived. Yeah, so. and, and I think you had a place, I believe I'm right, and you may still have a place in, in Los Angeles, um, because you made your first success over there, I think, as a, as a sound, uh, sorry, as a voiceover person, which links into the next question, which is, from Robert Taylor saying, you enunciate so exquisitely, and you've demonstrated that earlier in the interview with doing your different accents. Um, are you naturally gifted or were you trained? I think it's, a, it's just a gift. I, I wasn't trained uh, as an actress. I didn't, I didn't train. I went straight from um, Cambridge after a couple of years. I mean, I just sort of messed about for a couple of years. And then I, I went into radio, which is where I really belong I suppose but um, I, I was I'm very lucky I'm very very lucky that looking as I look and with the figure that I don't have I made a living and I'm extremely grateful for that and, I really and am. Really, you're still working a lot I, mean, I am still I, I am still working I haven't been found out yet um, <laughs> but Okay. No, it's, I've been, you know, I just am lucky. Some people are lucky. I know, I know other actresses who are just as good as I was and, and, and they just didn't have the luck that I had. It's luck. No, you've got a great presence. You know that. You've got a great presence in whatever role you do. Um, I've got gifts. I have certainly got gifts, but it, our profession is a cruel profession and you need a lot of luck as well. And I, I had it. I had it. Yes. Okay. Tricia says, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Well, I wanted to be a doctor when, uh, when I was a child. But um, I now just want to keep, keep going as long as I can. I'm, 
I have health problems. I have a very weak bladder. So that if I want to go to the loo, I really want to go to the loo. You know, I can't, I can't, as they say, piss about. I've got to go straight there. And um, that can be a nuisance if you're in costume. I mean, for example, being the mother superior, there's all these skirts and things you have to lift up. And it, it takes time. Um, somebody wanted to know who I've enjoyed working with the most. Oh, I think, I think Eileen Atkins uh, is somebody that I absolutely love and worship. I mean, she's just a great actress. She's, she's in um, Doc Martin. She plays the, the older lady in Doc Martin and she's just fabulous. So I would say that she's the person I've enjoyed working with most. In fact, one of the short films you've just done, I, I see Virginia McKenna is in it. I know, we, pay, we play a couple of old lesbians. Oh, really? <laughs> Which in my case is no, no stretch at all. <laughs> but I think it's a, a considerable stretch for, for Virginia, who is an absolutely lovely lady, real yeah. a beautiful person, just, yeah. just lovely. She's always come across like that. Um, okay, this is uh, um, Ken Russell, but I hope not from the dead. This is a different Ken Russell, I assume. Uh, personally, I love that you don't I use the censor but button, and that you speak honestly. Um, but have you always been like that? Yes, Ken, I have always been like that. I, I don't seem to observe the, the filters that other people have. And it means that sometimes things pop out which perhaps would be best unpopped but that's my nature that's my personality I suppose and I don't I don't always do it to shock I mean sometimes I do because it's it's fun when you see people's mouths drop open and they think did she really say that and that's that is kind of fun for me but I don't I don't do it always for that reason. I, I just do say things and ask the sort of questions that other people don't seem to ask. <laughs> and the final question uh, from the audience from Julie Moore, but, but I think there's time for me to ask you a couple more, is if you were given three wishes by a genie, what would they be? Well, if I was given three wishes, uh, I would like a strong bladder, <laughs> another another foot in height and um that'll do i don't need any more <laughs> that's it. was it has it been a problem for you in your life not being as tall as as maybe other people? no i don't i don't think it's been a problem but it's irritating because you know wherever you go and stay the the cupboards are always too high up <laughs> and i'm stretching for a for a plate or a jug or something in my in my kitchen cupboards. I do have stools that I can stand on all over the place. And, but you do feel a bit of a, you know, a bit of an idiot. All and when you were younger, did you spend your time in high heel shoes? I'm sure as you got For older. a short time, I wore high heeled shoes when it was fashionable. But now I only wear the trainers um, from New Balance. New Balance trainers are the only ones that I wear because they're wide enough and I've got very, very wide feet. Thank you for sharing that. Um, given that you're, you're, I think, I believe I'm right in saying your partner lives, you, your Australian partner lives in the Netherlands, I think. Yes, uh, yes, she you've does. You've got a place in Australia, you've got a place in Tuscany, which we haven't talked about. Uh, and you've got- Well, oh, it's available for rental. I'd like to just point that out. <laughs> it sleeps 10 and it's, they, it's a thousand pounds a week, right through the year. Where are in it's beautiful. Where are in Tuscany? Near Siena. Very nice. Okay, what I was gonna <laughs> what I was gonna ask was, are you getting COVID crazy? I being stuck in your house in your beautiful house in Clapham. Are you wishing you could be travelling to one or other of these places? Oh well I think yes. I, I'm I'm actually lonely because my my partner isn't here. She's she's um you know what you call it sheltering in in amsterdam she's right yeah. and um oh good i'm glad you, you can rent my property sometime pam um <laughs> definitely um i i uh i i do feel 
sad. I, I, my mood is very variable. Sometimes I burst into tears and sometimes I feel despair. And I, you know, I think, when will it ever end? And, and I, I, my concentration is not great. I find I start a book and I stay with it for a bit and then I have to walk about or do something else. So I think it does have an effect. It's, it's affected all of us. Yes. It's even affected Boris Johnson because he's even more of a twat now than he was before he started. <laughs> in a normal day when you're in Clapham, would you be wandering down the road to go and have a coffee somewhere? And... No, well, yes, normal times. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a lovely uh, French place on the Common, which I used to love, on the and corner really? of Venn Street, but they sold it. Oh, really? And, um, I've, there is another sh shop there now, but... Yes, I mean, I'm a social animal. I love being with my friends, going out, going to the theatre. And the theatre is, is in a terrible state. And, you know, that's why we have to do all we can to support the Omnibus, because they've done some fabulous things there. And yes. it's a delightful theatre. It really is. And I think probably at this point I should ask Mari Maria to come back in, I think. Yes, you're right. Thank you for your patience with me. Very oh, much. dear Peter, thank you yeah. for being so gentle with me. It was lovely. Don't be daft, it's been a delight. Uh, Marie, I don't know if you're uh, around. I think we're about ready for you. There's Mari. Hello. Off you go, Mari. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I'm here sitting in the box office and I just wanted to show you all what we've been up to. Um, since Miriam helped us to save the building. So we opened in 2013 and here's a little video just to give you a flavour of, of what we've been doing. So on the 16th of March, it all stopped. Um, I cancelled 157 performances. We couldn't support our artists. We couldn't connect with our local communities. All the hires, the cafe bar that we'd recently refurbished, we couldn't launch that. Like all the theatres, like everyone's activities, all came to a halt. 80% um, of our team, have been furloughed and myself and two others have been working tirelessly throughout trying to figure out what can we do. We needed to keep connection with our audiences so we've been learning a lot about Zoom and about how to platform work, present work so we have um, launched a, a festival online, we had a weekend's worth of work in response to racism that the East Asian community had faced in the light of this virus and um, we got a we got pick of the week in the Guardian and we managed to attract eight and a half thousand viewers. We needed to keep contact with our communities and I learned that there was a lot of seniors, this is via Age UK, that seniors were suffering trauma and they were concerned about post-traumatic stress disorder. So I managed to get some money thanks to the April Trust and we have a storyteller working on Zoom with 12 seniors from Age UK and they're doing creative writing and sharing their experiences. We got a little bit of money from the Arts Council to help us to keep going. And in the summer, we're gonna be launching six weeks worth of, um, of, of working with young people who are not getting food. They're suffering food security and we're gonna be doing drama with them. We'll be providing breakfast, mid-morning snack, and lunches, and thanks to the Arts Society for that support. You might be able to hear some ripples of activity in the cafe bar. We just opened it last weekend, 
and I've been here trying to develop a new business. Um, people knew the Cafe Bar because of the theatre, but now we have to run it as an independent part of the organisation until theatre returns. We don't know when that's going to be. At this point, I'm going to hand you over to our chair, Fiona McTaggart. I'm sitting at the moment in the theatre in Omnibus. And as you can see behind me, it's dark. And it's been dark for 119 days. And all that time, although you've just heard from Marie, all the things that we're doing despite not being able to operate that theatre, in that time we haven't actually had paying audiences which are the lifeblood of what Omnibus does. And if we look back to our last day, I just thought, let's look at what we did on a normal day. And the final day, in, on the 15th of March, we had the National Childbirth Trust having their regular meeting here. We had jazz at lunchtime. We had a version of the importance be of being earnest up in the studio upstairs. We had a wonderful show in the theatre, Can I Help You, which is looking at race and gender and mental health. We uh, had jazz, um, a two-speak jazz in the evening. And that's typical of Omnibus. And actually all that activity is usually funded. But in this period, we haven't been able to do that kind of thing. We haven't been able to sell tickets. We have depended on the generosity of people like you who have paid what you can to be part of this Zoom and the trust which Marie has described, which has helped what we've done. But actually, we're broke. We will survive this. We have a plan which means that as soon as we can do outdoor performance, we're looking at doing a, a bicycle version of Midsummer Night's Dream. We have plans for a Christmas show if we can do indoor performances and the work with young people, which Marie's decided, described. But what we need is we need the people who love what we do to be a bit like Miriam's grandpa. Remember that diamond he handed over so that she could survive? Well, if any of you have a wee diamond that you can hand over to Omnibus so we can survive, we would be very grateful. If you just send us a check, make sure that you claim the gift aid on it so that the treasury can increase it by 20%. That would make a real difference to our ability to keep going and to continue with the real quality work that we know we're capable of offering our local audience here in Clapham and more widely. So please, if you can, give us something. It will help us to build and grow and continue to exist. Because frankly, if you remember that little film at the beginning when Lambeth Council were trying to shut this down and not keep it as a centre, well, we beat that then and we're going to beat coronavirus now with your help. Thank you very much. Back to Marie, who's going to say goodbye to you all from us. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Miriam, so much. Thank you, Peter. And I wish you were here so that we could just give you a proper clap. I hope it's not too long. Thank you all very much. And please come into our cafe bar. Please come and say hello. It'll be lovely to see you. Thank you to you all for your support. Good night.